thank you so much for being here. It's just an amazing opportunity and privilege. I'm really sorry about the mic stand. I just got told that I'm not supposed to have notes, but I don't think I'd be able to deliver without it. So I'm going to take the role of a bit of a comedian. So just bear with me on that. Sorry, Daniel. So uh, is that okay? Great. So uh, my name's, uh, oh yeah, I'll have that as well. Thank you. Back and forward. Okay. So my name's Zoe. I'm creative director of the Jamie Oliver brand. I've worked with him for about 15 years. No, for 15 years, not about 15 years. And uh, the question that I get asked the most, without doubt, is, is he the real deal? Is he the person that I want him to be after watching him on TV or wherever I've seen him? And I'm here to tell you that he absolutely 100% is. And for some people, that makes them really happy. And for other people, it makes them really angry. And I don't 100% know why, but I suppose it doesn't really matter because as long as there's some sort of emotional reaction and emotional engagement, then we're kind of all doing our job. The fact that he is the same person, whether you see him on TV or whether you meet him in the street, is completely relevant to the conversation that I want to have with you today. I want to talk to you a little bit about our theory, we laughingly call it a strategy, but actually it's a theory, about how we can amplify a single voice through a curated chorus and then activate a crowd to make meaningful change in our food culture. To do that, I need to take you right back to the beginning. Actually, I don't need to, I just want to. Take you right back to the beginning and tell you a little bit about how Jamie and I met. So let's see if I can do this backward forward thing. Yay. So, so, so cute. So uh, this is Jamie and Zoe Ball. And uh, I used to work on the Zoe Ball Radio on Breakfast show. I was a member of the posse. Woo! <laughs> and uh, this is us filming the Millennium Eve Breakfast show. Jamie is super young, as you can see. And indeed, Zoe looks amazing. That's why she's got the 2000 thing on her head, because it's the Millennium show. And it's really relevant, that picture for me, apart from just reminding me that all that sort of enthusiasm and hard work and, and consistency that went into the person that Jamie is right at the beginning. This show and, and the party that happened after the show is the first time that Jamie and I really properly talked about things that were important to us and our future plans and our ambitions and our fears. And Jamie told me at this event that he had just secured jamieoliver.com and jamieoliver.co.uk. And to my shame, I went, meh, meh, whatever. <laughs> and I, I was passionate at that time about radio and TV and all sorts of um, important analog things. But we also talked a little bit about how we had a deep held belief that media could change the world. And we truly wanted to uh, connect with audiences and help people uh, move their consciousness along into better ways of thinking. We got pretty drunk that night, if I'm really honest. And to be honest, the conversation didn't pick up again for another six to nine months when we finally remembered that we'd had this quite inspiring thought. He contacted me. He said, I want to set up a TV company. Now, he was really happy with Optimum and with Pat Llewellyn, who I know some people know here. And he loved working there. But he wanted to do something more profound. And it's really important, I think, this, this aspect of who he is. He wanted to take control of his own image and he wanted to take control of his own destiny. And he wanted to do that because he wanted to be authentic about who he is and what he does. And that authenticity rings through on absolutely everything that he has done ever since then. And it's really important because it is through authenticity that we can be consistent and it is through consistency that we can build trust. You can trust Jamie to be the same person wherever and whenever you meet him. It's never changed. It's what he always strives for. And there are some things about Jamie that remain consistent I'll talk to you about. He has consistently had the sense of humour of a 12-year-old prepubescent boy. There is nothing that is more likely to score you brownie points than a really good willy joke. He loves olive oil and chilies, like really loves olive oil and chilies. He's always the hardest working person in the room. And he cares about food. I mean, he really, really cares about food. We all care about food in here, I know. But he has the courage to care about it beyond anyone else. 
I am more likely to get a shirty email from him complaining about crew food because he is mortally offended at the sight of prepackaged sandwiches. Or I'm more likely to have him, and he has done this, put down an entire filming crew because we've taken too long to pick up the shots of the pasta and it's overcooked than anything else. He's really brave about how he wants food to be portrayed, and he's really brave about how important that is, that we take away from him and from everything he does a really good food message. So, we sum this up. and I keep looking there. Nothing's changing, actually. I just it feels like a nice punctuation. So we summed this up in a, in a mission. I mean, for 10 years, we just were instinctively doing stuff. And then we summed up what we really were about in a mission quite recently. And it's, uh, it's that we want people to live healthier, happier lives through food. And that's really who we are. It's what we get excited about. It's what, we, it's what authentically makes us who we are. When we hear about our book sales, or we hear about our latest TV numbers, or we look at our digital reach numbers, it's not really just those numbers that we're feeling. It's the fact that we have an opportunity here through those connections with those people to engage, to encourage people to engage with our mission. Those, in, those connections mean that people may be better informed, they may be more inspired, but it almost definitely, or we hope it does, help them to lead healthier, happier lives. It gets us up every day. It gets us really excited. Here are some of the numbers. They're pretty good. Actually, 200 TV broadcasters, 10 million monthly unique viewers, 37 million in book sales. That's not pounds, by the way, that's books sold. They're really good numbers. We feel great about those. And we feel great because we know that with each of those, there is some sort of impact that's allowing us to move our mission along. We know that all those people have given us permission to come into their lives. We don't take that lightly. We know it's a huge privilege to be having that conversation with people all the time. And we know that trust is hard won and easily lost. And we make sense of that every single day with what we do. Trust comes from authenticity and consistency. And that is what Jamie is and strives to be every day. But these numbers are just one person. And if we think about the bigger goal that we have set ourselves, which is changing the consciousness of people around the world to live healthier, happier lives, these aren't even beginning to scratch the surface. So what do we do? Well, another really consistent aspect of who Jamie is, and if I'm honest, I didn't recognize this for a really long time because I was the living proof of it and I was living it, is that he believes in talent. He believes in new talent. He believes in engaging, encouraging, and empowering people to be the best that they possibly can be. I thought that this might be an aspect of, of all chefs in all kitchens for quite a long time, um, because there's that sort of environment in chefs' kitchens where you know, there's a team and you want people to move on up the ranks. But I've now met enough chefs who are actually quite scared by upcoming talent to realize that actually it's, it's not prevalent in all chefs. This is, a, this is a real important aspect of who he is. So the first show that Jamie and I made together was Jamie's Kitchen, which was the living proof that this is a man who wants to nurture and feed talent. So, I don't know, did you all watch Jamie's Kitchen? Do you remember it? It was a hell of a long time ago now. For those of you that didn't, the idea was that we would take 15 young people who weren't in employment or weren't in education, who were otherwise disenfranchised with the society, and we would teach them how to cook, and we would ultimately open a restaurant. But there was a really serious documentary question at the heart of it. It was, is success limited by circumstances? That was our question as the producers. For Jamie, it was something much, much simpler. It was, can I teach kids to cook? And can I inspire chefs? So I'm going to walk away from the mic and I'm going to tell you what happened. Ben Arthur, head chef at the Fistral Beach restaurant. Johnny owns two restaurants. Ralph, head chef at the Pikey on Sunset Boulevard. Dreadful name, amazing restaurant. <laughs> Jamie. Warren Fleet, head chef at the Hope and Anchor in Waterloo. Fantastic restaurant. Uh, Tim, he was named most up-and-coming chef in the Financial Times a little while ago. He's the head chef at Trulo. Kevin, sadly, very sadly, actually, a brilliant chef and a very talented guy who sadly no longer with us. Kerry Lewis, head chef at the Hope and Anchor 
Marianne, if any of you watch Friday Night Feast, you'll know that she still sits in the cafe at the end of South End Pier. She's a mum, she's also a head chef at a nursery, and she helps us at the Ministry of Food, Loads and Training. Alicia went on actually to pursue a media career and is now working for So, of the seven people who are still with us, six have gone on to do extraordinary, extraordinary things in food. And what's really brilliant is they carry our mission for us with, forward with them all the time. They are taking Jamie's thoughts and feelings and desires and beliefs and a happier, healthier life through food further, 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 further forward. They were, although we didn't know it at the time, the beginning of our chorus or the amplification of Jamie's voice through a curated chorus, a chorus that we would control, a chorus that we would ask to harmonise with us and move our stories further forward. It was instinctive, as I've said, for a long time. Now we, now we have a name for it. Now we call it the voice of the chorus theory. And our chorus consists of all of our employees. I'm chorusing right now in front of you whether you can tell that or not. Our 15 graduates, our Food Revolution Day ambassadors, our Ministry of Food instructors, our Kitchen Garden Project teachers. These are people who we invest in continually and we ask them to move our story and our mission further forward. And of course, technology allows us to uh, find and connect with more and more people every day. The most obvious example is FoodTube, and I was going to show you a showreel, but I don't think I have completely enough time. But FoodTube is our multi-channel YouTube network. It's a really good example of how we are using the power of technology to develop our curated chorus. Indeed, we have some esteemed FoodTubers with us right here, right now. So FoodTube was created out of two converging issues. One issue was that the uh, TV audiences were changing, the TV food audiences were changing, their demographic were changing. We could see that younger people wanted to engage with food content in different places. And if we were to achieve our mission, we had to be in those places where people wanted to gather that content. The other thing was that we just fall in love all the time with new talent. We would meet a brilliant chef. We would meet a brilliant supplier. We would love them and we would be so frustrated that there was nowhere, there wasn't enough shelf space in the t food TV to place all this talent. And so we came up with our strategy, our first strategy, if I'm really honest. And that was, let's use a little bit of Jamie. Let's draw an audience and create a platform that allows us to shine a light on all these people that we really care about. It was a different platform. It required a different approach. It's more playful, more informal, more risk-taking. It is always authentic to who we are. And so trust passes from Jamie to those other talent. And we are allowed to help chefs create their own content, create their own channels, create their own audiences. And some of them have had books and TV shows and all sorts of things that follows that. We don't own those books and TV shows. That's not what it's about. It's about allowing success to flourish and go further and further forward. So we have Jamie. He's our single, authentic, consistent voice. We have our chorus, all singing in harmony, all looking to take our mission onwards. Is that enough? Well, let's talk about the mission. The mission is a healthier, happier life through food. And the enemy, the opposite, the antithesis of that mission is really the prevalence of type 2 diabetes and the fact that more and more people are, are becoming terribly ill and it's, it's becoming younger and younger. I know that type 2 diabetes is in some place about genetics, but on the whole, it is about lifestyle choices. And it's crippling the NHS, and it's crippling our nation, literally crippling us. I've got some facts here, and this is why I had to have these notes, because I need to read them. Gosh, that's showing something I hate. That's a bit worried, talking to millennials. In 13 years of British combat in Iran and Afghanistan, there have been 300 amputations. Awful, terrible. That's, that's a really big number of people whose lives are dramatically impacted. In 2015, in the UK alone, there were 7,000 amputations due to type 2 diabetes. I want you to really think and understand the impact of that, not just on those individuals, but on the opportunity that this country misses out on due to that fact. I'm going to show you some, another. Oh, that was Felicitas. How did I miss her? Sorry. I'll, I'll tell you about her later. OK. So, so. This is a table that Jamie presented at the Health Select Committee just last night. I don't know if any of you saw that. He did a really sterling job of talking to the Health Select Committee about why we are for and behind a sugary drinks tax. Let me tell you why I think it's important. So this is a graph of 
childhood obesity going up here. This is about deprivation. Be deprived, be deprived. The point that I'm trying to make with that is that most people who are impacted by these lifestyle choices are probably not watching Superfood on Channel 4 on a Monday night. We're converted, we're talking, we're preaching to a converted at the moment. So how do we move beyond that? How do we move beyond our curated chorus and impact in a true, real, meaningful way on a wider society? This is our theory. We will put the power of Jamie's brand behind the people, the companies, and the ideas that are engaged in a healthy debate to impact at scale in a true, real, and meaningful way, whoever they are. We must be brave. We must be the power behind the conversation. And it has to be bigger than us. It has to be bigger than anything that we can control and we have to allow it to flourish. We are the first to admit that we do not have all the answers, but we are not going to stop looking. We want to empower a billion conversations, and we will work with those who can impact in any sort of a real way, at scale, on the health and happiness of a global population through food. So, this is my ask of you. I ask you to do the same. I ask you to be authentic. I ask you to be consistent, to build trust, to build your audience, and then have the courage to turn your audience into an active community. Empower and nurture them, fuel a million conversations. And then maybe in the process, we might actually do something to change the world. Thank you very much.